Good afternoon, Bill. William Lane Craig is quite a famous debater and very accomplished in his own field. How did you feel about debating him on this subject? Well, I was nervous debating uh, with the prospect of debating him. He's debated many of the finest atheist, sceptic and humanist thinkers uh, alive today. So yes, I was nervous about that. But I didn't want to debate him on his own terms. He was very, very adamant, as were his minders, that the moot of the debate should be exactly as he had set out Really, it doesn't matter for him who he's debating. He's really got a set line that he's going to give without respect to who he's, who he's debating. So what I wanted to do was to change the terms of the debate so that it wasn't just going to be another dreary either or, he said, she said, this is true, this is not true, which really is only going to appeal to or convince those who are already partisans for one side or another. For this question to matter, for this question to be important, I think what we've got to do is see what the terms of the debate are and how we can talk to each other rather than talk past each other. That's what I was trying to do in this debate. So I was looking at asking the question, is it is Dr. Craig's notion of God the only one that Christians ascribe to? And of course the answer is no. We have all sorts of different accounts of God that Christian theologians have discussed and have argued over the last century. So what Dr. Craig obviously failed to do was to give any indication why his notion of God was the only one that we can take seriously. But he wanted to do this, he said, she said, my God's right, any other idea just doesn't work at all and has no credibility. That's the sort of debate that we have to move past in the 21st century. Because atheists aren't going away, their numbers are growing around the world, and Christians aren't going away. Their numbers may be declining in many areas in the West at least, but they're not going to go away. So we're going to have to learn to live with each other and talk with each other, not talk past each other. This debate looked as if it was going to be another opportunity to talk past each other and to throw epithets. What I was trying to do was to avoid that confrontational approach and have him justify why his was the only valid Christian response. That he never did. You said that Dr. Craig was very inflexible on the terms of the discussion. Mm -hmm. Did you try to negotiate any other dif uh, different ways of negotiating? Oh, yes. I was in email negotiation with, I didn't get to speak to him at all. It was with his minders and backers to look toward a different moot so that we could try and discuss something more constructive. I wanted to do a discussion on how it is, as an atheist and a rationalist and a humanist, I live my life, and how he, as an evangelical Christian, lives his, so that we could give testimony about our lives and discuss the intellectual foundations of it without necessarily slagging each other off in a he-said-she-said contest that, as I've already said, doesn't get anywhere. But no, he was completely uninterested, or at least his minders were completely uninterested in any... Uh, negotiation on the moot or the format. So once it was clear that they weren't going to move on the moot, I thought, well, let's see if we can change the format, because it's a very rigid, confrontational idea of the 20 minutes address, 20 minutes first rebuttal, five minutes, whatever it was, second rebuttal, and another five minutes closing statement. So it left a lot less time for the audience to ask questions. One of the most interesting dynamics in any public occasion like this is interacting with the audience. Now this, of course, was what Dr. Craig was anxious to avoid, so there was more time for his well-prepared set pieces. So I was trying to negotiate for fewer rebuttals so that there would be more time for audience participation and asking. Then I was trying this, trying that, all sorts of requests to change the format, change the mood, Eventually, I got a reply from one of his uh, minders. I put the compromise format of the debate, as I discussed with you, to Dr. Craig. He definitely wants only, in capitals, the original format. This is a standard debating format. 
only in capitals, this is acceptable to him. So that's the understanding Dr. Craig had of uh, negotiation or compromise with a debating um, opponent. There was to be none. So it was done entirely on his terms or no terms at all. What does it you mean by atheism? Well, that's a good question. This gets to the, the core of the issue. You see, he wanted uh, me to take on a confrontational line of atheism is a delusion and no possibility of virtue or credit lies in a Christian position. I simply wasn't prepared to argue that. I go back to the English atheist, Charles Bradlaugh, who didn't say... In fact, I'll quote his words. He says, The atheist does not say there is no God. But what he says is, I know not what you mean by God. So the word God is a sound conveying no clear or distinct affirmation. So in other words, what, what Bradlaugh was saying is, you have religious person A, like Dr. Craig, insisting that God is this, that, and the other. But then you have religious person B, another Christian in all likelihood, completely disagreeing with that and saying that no, that's not the case. God is this, that and the other. And then theist C may well give us a completely different perspective and so on and so on and so on. So what the atheist is left with is a whole series of assertions, usually put very aggressively and, and confidently, that God is this, that or the other. They are human assertions by people to determine the situation. They are, there's nothing objective, there's no evidence beyond the assertion that this is valid. So, I am without, atheism is being without an idea of God. So it's the only intellectually responsible position for me to take to be a theist. Because I can't see any particular reason to accept this dogmatic assertion about God's nature as opposed to this dogmatic assertion about God's nature. For me, I am without an idea of God that isn't simply somebody's dogmatic assertion. Now, having moved, for, having got to that atheist position, and this was what was so sadly lacking in this debate, is what do you do then? Because nobody can be simply an atheist. An atheist simply about what I'm not, what I don't believe in. Far more interesting, surely, and far more worthwhile in terms of finding common agreement with those that we may disagree with on this, that, or the other, is to look at what I do believe in and where I might have things in common with my theist neighbour. So... An atheist is only what, I, what I'm not, what I'm rejecting. What I'm accepting as a humanist is a whole series of values that predate Christianity, but many Christians hold as well, in terms of um, working as an able citizen, helping others, the maxim, live well and help others live well, a variation on the golden rule, which is, can be found in all the religious and philosophical traditions of the world. My theist neighbour and myself would not disagree fundamentally on many of these ideas about what we agree on. But what, of course, Dr. Craig was so anxious to, to maintain was the areas where we disagree so that he could fire up the large evangelical component of his audience. What I was looking for, by contrast, was to find areas where we might find common agreement. It's not to sweep under the carpet the areas where we disagree. They are very significant. But I really think there's nothing to be gained in the long run from accentuating the differences. Should we not be looking toward where we agree, where we can work together? The planet is in too much danger. We're facing too many serious threats to start arguing the toss over abstractions like the existence of God.